please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Lynn Clark. Thank you, thank you, well done. Well, as you can see, I'm fortunate. Can you hear me? OK. OK, good. Um, thank you for inviting me. But my first question today is to you. A show of hands. How many of you guys are juniors? So seniors? Ah, lots of job hunters in that group. Yes. Um, how about grad students? First year or second year? Second year. Second, mostly second. OK, great. And undergrads, uh, I mean uh, underclassmen, uh, freshmen and sophomores. Oh, OK, uh, here and there. OK, so the reason I asked that question, oops, sorry, I forgot Buzz, um, is because the consumer for most of the companies I've worked for has been my boss. So the question is for you, where do you guys want to work? Today, you're my consumer. So that's why I asked about you. But it's important for you to think about the, co the companies that you might want to work for as your consumers. What can you do for them? What can you do for them that's, whoops, sorry, whoop, a little too fast there. Um, there. What can you do that's better than anyone else can do for them? You'll have lots of competition. So that's why I want to know a little bit about you. And hopefully what I share today will give you some ideas on how you can be competitive in interviews, how you can be competitive once you get a job, and how you can be successful throughout your career. So today's agenda. Yes, there's some goofy job hunting stories and some serious job hunting stories. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how I got here today. And you know, when you give a CEO a microphone and a clicker, you're going to hear some leadership lessons. So yes, Lynn's leadership lessons for today. And finally, um, you'll get a little Metro Kitchen commercial because all of you are targets because you all have people you can buy kitchen gifts for. So, so bear with me on the commercial. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have been extremely fortunate to get a great foundation for what I've done so far in my career with companies like General Mills and Pepsi. Um, they have really made a huge difference in my career. And here's some CEO advice. So many students, graduating students, undergrads, graduate school students, want to start their own business, build the next Facebook. And what I'm saying today, which is go out and get a job with a big company, a company where you can build a great foundation for your career. That's not sexy. You know, it's, it's sexy to try to figure out how you can build the next Facebook. The, those statistics on building the next Facebook, whatever it might be, are probably much smaller numbers than even becoming a professional athlete. So when you think about it that way, having a couple years under your belt at a big company with gr great training, great job experience, and some tough competition is, is a really good thing to think about. OK, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> so my leadership lessons for today and I'm going to talk about each one of these in relationship to both my interview anecdotes as well as some of my jobs over the course of the years. So do what you love. If you have a problem, solve it and own it. People are your most valuable resource. Make sure you keep thanking them. And get a line job, at least one. And I'll talk about that. I'll talk about all these later on. Whoops. We have a little. OK. So how many of you have ever heard of this book or read it or heard the expression, do what you love and the money will follow? OK, so a smattering of you. It's a pretty good book. Um, more importantly, it's a pretty good philosophy and a, a great leadership lesson. Um, I started working, that's a library in Pittsburgh, um, when I was 14. Not because I had to or because I planned it. I, went, I was a geek, a complete and total geek. And there was going to be a photo in here, but I just couldn't bear to share it. Um, I, when I was a kid, you know, in middle school, I went to the library every weekend, and I took out a stack of 10 books. This was you know, before, long before iPads and such things. Um, 
And one day the librarian said to me, do you read all those books every week? And I said, mm-hmm. She said, do you want to work here? I said, well, I'm 12. <laughs> so when I was 14, because it was a nonprofit organization, I started working at the library. It was a great job to have in high school. They were closed on Friday and Saturday nights. What more could you want, right? So be yourself, do what you love. Absolutely critical. I had the same experience with my first job out of college. Let's see. Um, and let's put this in perspective for you guys. The college I went to was nothing close to Georgia Tech. You probably have never heard of it. It's in Pittsburgh. It's called Point Park University. It's way different than you guys. Um, we didn't have zillions, and co the college still doesn't, didn't have zillions of companies recruiting on campus. It was up to me. <clears throat> oh, and did I mention I have a BA in journalism? Do you know any school where people come and recruit for journalism majors? <laughs> Not very many of them. So fortunately, I was part of a high school editor's group sponsored by the big daily newspaper in Pittsburgh. I loved being an editor in high school. You know, this do what you love thing. I loved writing. And um, through this high school editor's program, I met people who made money from journalism. And in fact, one of those people, when I was uh, in my last semester at college, called me and said, hey, there's a job here doing copywriting in the marketing department. Let me introduce you to the guy who's filling it. So that's how I got my first job at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Again, good things happen to me when I do what I love, and I am who I am. And I think that's true for pretty much everyone I've ever met. So. <clears throat> Of all the companies that I work for, PepsiCo, where I happen to have worked the longest, I was there for 10, 10 years, PepsiCo had the biggest impact on my career and gave me the foundation to acquire Metro Kitchen and run it today. Um, but I do have a couple interview stories. So I was living in Boston. Oops, sorry. This is about solving the problem. So I was living in Boston. I had taken a vacation day from my job at General Mills to go interview in New York at Pepsi. Of course, we had a really bad weather day in Boston, and the flight that I was supposed to be on and a lot of other flights in the New York metro area were canceled. So about 5 that morning, I was on the phone. Now remember, this is back in 1990. There was no GPS. There were no cell phones. There, well, there was the internet was not. You couldn't get an, a reservation online with an airline. So you know, I was on the phone at home and then on a payphone at the airport, letting the recruiter know that I was still getting to New York to interview for this job at Pepsi. I flew into Newark. I drove up to Pepsi. It's about a 50-mile drive. Never having done that before, and hoping for the best with a AAA map I happened to have found at home. <laughs> And I got to Pepsi for that interview on time. Boy, did I get points for that one. You know, I had a lot of competition for that job. And I know that making it through a crappy weather day, figuring out how to rent a car versus having a limo pick me up at the airport near Pepsi, that, saw, that really set me apart from all the other candidates. And it's something to think about, because you have competition. In fact, for you guys, it's global competition, something I didn't have to worry about back in 1990. <clears throat> the other Pepsi story um, relates to a principle that I really hope you remember from my talk today, and that's being yourself and knowing yourself. So <clears throat> um, at the time, Southwestern art was a big deal. And I had been to Phoenix a couple weeks before that and bought a few little cheapo pieces of artwork because I really liked it. Um, and uh, my second interview of the day was with the division president. A big deal, right? So I walked into his office, and before I could stop myself, my giant mouth opened, and I said, oh, Mr. Craner, I just love your office. Oh, I thought, OK, there goes the job. You know, this interview is toast. I, was, I felt like a really sort of silly, ditzy girl. Well, it turned out that Mr. Craner loved his Southwestern decor office. And he particularly loved it because it set him apart from a lot of the other Pepsi executives who, you know,
know, had your standard walnut desk kind of office. So another point, another reason that it's really important to do what you love, be who you are, and solve that problem. For me, that day at Pepsi really enabled me to do both of those. Even though if you had asked me at the time, I would not have even, uh, not have even thought about those two leadership principles. That's come from working for a long time. OK, <clears throat> so the, another job hunting anecdote. Um, I did go on a CEO job on a walker, not dressed like that. Um, but uh, about 10 years ago, I fell off a roof and broke a variety of useful appendages, like an arm and um, a wrist and uh, a heel. So I couldn't walk, so I hopped for three months. It was a very long summer. Um, and I wasn't working because I had sold the company where I had previously been the CEO. So, and I wasn't planning on working for a little while because I had won a fellowship, an Eisenhower Fellowship, to study in Australia and New Zealand. So I got a phone call about this job at a company called Fox Run. Fox Run sold housewares. So things like potato peelers and baking sheets and you know, uh, small ramekins to bake things in. And, uh, they, we must have had 10,000 SKUs. And we sold a lot of cookie cutters. That's actually how the company started. So um, as you might have guessed, I'm, I'm, I'm able to walk a little bit on one foot. So I'm hopping, sort of walking, rolling up to the door on my walker. My real challenge that, that, that day, though, was getting the pantyhose on. But that's for another story. Um, so I'm you know, kind of maneuvering my way up to the door. And this older man in a short sleeve plaid shirt, kind of an unattractive plaid shirt, comes running out, opens the door, helps me in, and I thanked him profusely. I mean, he was fabulous, and we just started chatting and, you know, not thinking anything about it. Again, I was myself. Turns out, <clears throat> this is a guy who worked for the private equity firm whose job was to hire the next CEO of this company. Do you think me chatting with him? And I'm sure he wore, wore that shirt because he's just an unassuming guy. And he wanted to make sure that the people he was interviewing were true to themselves and didn't judge him based on what he had on. It's a really good lesson. So um, be yourself, do what you love, solve the problem. And because I thanked him so much, it was kind of excessive, actually, particularly when I found out who he was. <laughs> um, that helped me a lot. So <clears throat> you guys have a huge advantage in job hunting because of the school that, that you're privileged to go to. Uh, you have a lot of companies that recruit on campus. Um, my husband tells the story. He went to Wharton. He tells this great story that um, he got the, the interview for Colgate Palmolive by bribing one of the guys who was on the interview list with a bottle of booze. So we'll do whatever you have to do to get the interview with the company that you want when they're on campus. It's really, really critical. So I think if you demonstrate that you're a problem solver, you know yourself, and you thank people, you'll have a leg up on the competition. Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. Anyway, <clears throat> the second part of my talk today Actually, you know what? I'm going to stop here. Do you guys have any questions about these crazy, goofy interview anecdotes? I mean, we'll have time for questions at the end, but I wanted to <coughs> ask you now if you had anything that was just burning in your heads that you wanted to ask. No? OK. All right, well, we'll keep going. So the second part of my talk today is how I got here, why you asked me to speak at Georgia Tech. So <clears throat> you're all numbers people, right? Here are my career stats. I've had 21 jobs in about that many years. I work, I've worked for eight companies. I've worked in 11 industries. I've had three CEO roles, and I sit on three boards of directors. That's a lot of numbers, right? Makes me seem like I'm ADD, I can't hold a job. Yep, yep, shaking of heads. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I'm not ADD, and I can hold a job, because two of those jobs were with the same company for 17 years, give or take. But I have learned that it's really important to get a lot of cross-functional experience. So working in everything from writing, to being a general manager, to being a sales operations manager. These are just a handful of the titles that I've had over the course of my career to date. And the ones that are in bold, if you can tell, are the ones that I think have had the most impact on my career. Um, <clears throat> here's a quick summary of uh, my background. I have a journalism degree from a college that I'm guessing none of you have ever heard of. I got a job at the Daily Newspaper in Pittsburgh at age 20. I went back to business school at the University of Pittsburgh for an MBA, then luckily was hired by General Mills as a marketing assistant. After a few years there, I got recruited to Pepsi, spent 10 years, had 10 jobs, as I said, including one as the general manager of the bottling business in Philadelphia, which I had you know, 350 plus people working for me. It's about a $100 million business. And that job is absolutely, absolutely essential for me being here today, as well as for what I do at Metro Kitchen. Then I had two CEO jobs, working for two different private equity firms. The first one I talked about having sold. We were in the um, <clears throat> wireless retail and direct marketing business. We sold pagers and cell phones, is another way to put that. <laughs> and um, then I went to Fox Run as the CEO of this housewares company. <clears throat> After that, I was tired of working for private equity firms, so I took every single dollar I ever made, put it on the line to acquire Metro Kitchen. So, that's how I got here today. Oh, and I am on three boards of directors, including one that's a Coca-Cola bottler, which is why you had a Coca-Cola logo on there, which I always think is kind of funny after having worked for PepsiCo for so long. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me. Let's get into some detail about a couple of these jobs to make a few points, particularly around why people are such valuable resources for you no matter what you do, and why I believe that if you want to run something, especially your own company, or you want to build something, it's important for you to have some line management experience. So, <clears throat> whoops, too fast. Um, at General Mills, there we go, <clears throat> uh, it's a great company. I got great marketing training, I got great management training, I got fabulous analytical training. I analyzed all of the markets where we had our products, figured out what our competition was doing. I mean, it was, it was a very disciplined place to work. I love working there. It was a great, great company. So after about a year and a half <clears throat> or so, I became the product manager for a brand called Gordon's. Some of you guys may remember fish sticks from when you were little kids. Um, I was on new products. And I was asked to be head of a cross-functional team. You know, so we had people from purchasing, we had people from manufacturing, R&D, marketing research, you know, kicked all sourcing because it was fish products. Um, we had to create a new product. Every one of these people <coughs> had significantly, and when I say significantly, really significantly more experience than I did. Some of them had kids who were older than me. <laughs> so, and their view of marketing people from previous experiences were that we were all sort of know-it-all MBA people and only cared about improving ourselves and getting promoted and getting on to the next brand. Eh, some of that's not too far from the truth. So, so I had a pretty big job. Oh, and I had a boss who was very much like this Dilbert comic. I'm sure you've heard stories about people like this. <clears throat> Perhaps you've had those experiences. So <clears throat> our goal as a team was to introduce a microwave fish stick before our competitors did. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we had a lot of challenges 
we kept setting microwaves on fire. So this is back in the 80s. You know, when microwaves were still, you know, they were like 95% penetration in the US. And people were still a little nervous about them. So this was not a good thing for our team. But let me tell you about the results. We beat our competitors to market by about a year. The new product drove serious, serious market share. It made Gorton's the number one brand in the whole category where it had just been kind of languishing at number two for you know 20 years or whatever. And it's still number one today. General Mills doesn't own it anymore, but it's still number one today. So as a team, we made it through all these obstacles. Um, <clears throat> why? Well, first off, we all wanted to win. We wanted to beat our competition. And I really was totally myself in leading this team. I knew I had to kind of get them all on my side if I expected to get anything done. So I told goofy stories. You can probably tell that I tell goofy stories. I made cookies. And most important, I always make cookies. That's not why I acquired Metro Kitchen, but I like to make cookies. Um, <clears throat> and I followed a really important leadership lesson, which was thank them. Ask them. Don't demand stuff. No matter what role you have, even if your title is president or CEO, it's always better to ask people and explain to them why you need something. It really makes a huge difference. Motivate people and recognize what they do for you. I know the guy from the office here doesn't agree with the, the vinegar and the honey and the sugar and all that, but you get a lot more done when you're nice to people than when you <clears throat> treat them with vinegar. And I really believe that is an absolute essential to why I have done well. So <clears throat> I finished General Mills. I got recruited to Pepsi, 10 years, 10 jobs. And my first job was marketing manager in the middle Atlantic region, you know, kind of Philly, Jersey area. I was so excited. Can you imagine, like, you get to work for one of the best marketing companies in the world. You know, people, a company that's been such an innovator in all kinds of marketing. We won't talk about Michael Jackson or any of the celebrity stuff that they innovated on, but it was, it was such a great opportunity. Well, <clears throat> less than a year into it, I realized this wasn't as great of an opportunity as I thought it was going to be because I wanted to run a company or a division or something. And unless I changed roles at Pepsi, that wasn't going to happen. Sales and sales operations were power jobs. They were the line management jobs. They had responsibility for the bottom line. <clears throat> Marketing wasn't quite like that at Pepsi. It was like that at General Mills, but it wasn't at Pepsi. And that's, I think, the fourth and most important leadership lesson that I can share with you today. Get a line job. One. So since most of you guys are business students, I'm going to assume that you know the difference between a line and a staff job. What? You know, a line job generates cash. Staff job, in short, is an expense. I know anyone in HR will argue with me till the cows come home on that, but that's sort of the basics of it. So here I am at Pepsi. <coughs> I want a line job, but I'm in marketing. I had another great boss. He said, well, go down a couple levels. You know, everything in a, co a big company is based on what level you are, how much money you get, what kind of bonuses you get, what your promotional opportunities are. He said, take a level cut. They won't touch your salary. That's the only way you're going to get a sales operations manager job. OK, sure. <clears throat> so what that meant was that I pretty much had to be in the office, oh, somewhere around 6 a.m. every day. Why? Because that's when the Teamsters, who drove the trucks, who sold the Pepsi to the customers and beat Coke all the time, that's when they were in the office. And my job was to make sure that they did what they were supposed to do and sold more Pepsi than Coke all the time. Not what you would think of as a you know, sort of marketing background, MBA kind of person would be wanting to do. Well, my friends in marketing, in fact, thought I had lost my mind and would shortly lose my job. This was an absolutely pivotal job in my career. It was a line job in one of the toughest, most competitive industries in the world. It often came down to pennies. It was where Pepsi and Coke 
made huge amounts of money. And if your guys didn't sell Pepsi at that moment and take money out of the store owner's pocket, we're talking a lot of small stores, you know, sort of bodegas up and down the street kind of stuff, then Coke was gonna take that business from you. So it was intense competition, tough environments to work in, very tough customers, certainly tough employees, <clears throat> and bottom line responsibility. That job, I would say that's been the most pivotal, jo pivotal, pivotal job in my career. It made me a much tougher business person, a much better business person, a much better negotiator, and ultimately a better leader. Because I was leading people that were not like me at all in terms of what they did for a living and what I wanted to do for a living. But you know what? When you thank them, they respond the same way. And that, that whole job was just an absolute key. You know, one of the reasons I know I succeeded is because I didn't become a teamster. <clears throat> I don't yell, I don't swear. <laughs> if I started down that path, those guys would have seen through me in about a tenth of a second, and I would have failed. I was who I am. I, didn't, I wasn't afraid to say, hey, let me go out on the truck with you, I'll build a display. They knew that I was not afraid to break a nail. And that was really important to gaining credibility with a bunch of these guys who thought, oh God, it's a marketing girl who's running us now. Oh, please. So, um, and I helped them, each and every one of them, make money. And that's really what it came down to for those guys. Because they were all commissioned salespeople, even though they drove trucks. That I helped them all make more money. And that helped me make more money and it helped me get promoted, of course. So, uh, I'm going to get back on my line soapbox for a minute and talk to the women in this, uh, this crowd. I know that when I was at Pepsi, I was tested more than any guy was tested. Now, I would like to say that that has changed. It's been more than 10 years since I've been there. I'm not sure that it has. Uh, I, I, I'm, I hope you don't experience that. But <laughs> when I came back, um, from vacation and took that job as the sales operations manager managing all these Teamster guys, I learned later that my colleagues, my peers, my competitors were betting, my male competitors were betting on me that I wouldn't come back and take this job because it was going to be too hard. I proved to senior management that I could do this and ultimately I became one of three women running a, a large market, running Philadelphia, um, as a general manager with full P&L responsibility. And that gives you a lot of credibility wherever you go, whatever you do. It even gives you credibility with banks. And at some point or another, we all need banks or financial people to help us find money. So, um, so as it turned out, oddly enough, you saw that penny slide up there that bounced around. The penny slide um, turned into very good training for running an e-commerce company today. Because when you guys go online to look to buy something, you first look at Amazon, right? Yes? No. Nope. And you look to see, OK, how cheaply can I get this thing, whatever it is? Is that right? Let me say, shaking heads, yes. So knowing how to manage down to the penny, which you don't think of, don't think you'll learn at a big company like Pepsi is really critical for what I do today, because I compete with all the big guys. So, okay. So now we have the Metro Kitchen commercial, sort of the third part of my talk. And I seem to be currently on time. So, um, I know that a lot of you want to start your own business. And I'm sure that's one of the reasons you're here in addition to being you know, <laughs> credit for class, is well, how did I go from two big companies to my own company? Well, here's the story. I, um, as I said earlier, uh, it's, I keep talking about knowing yourself. It's essential. I was a, the GM in Philadelphia for, for Pepsi for a few years. And then I was asked to go to New York and do a strategic planning job. I was a good corporate citizen, so I did that. I did it for three months and said, oh, this is not what I want to do. I want to run a company where I can have an impact every day. So I'm having an impact every day in Philadelphia as the GM. I'm not having an impact in New York 
writing presentations to show to the CEO. Okay, I had enough visibility in the company, so I decided to leave. Pepsi was great, that helped me in oh so many ways. Sometimes it is difficult to drink a Coke, but I still do it because I love my Coke bottler. But <laughs> um, I wanted to work as a CEO for a smaller company, for a mid-market company. So that's how I got to the first job. Um, and then I went to the second one, working for another private equity firm, running a housewares company. And, um, you know, PE firms um, are all about the bottom line, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm all about the bottom line, too. But I also strongly believe that you have to care about your customers, otherwise the bottom line won't happen. And you have to motivate your employees, otherwise the bottom line won't be as big as it could be otherwise. So I decided that it was time for me to figure out a way to acquire my own business. I saw how much money the private equity guys were taking out of the firms that I had worked for and that I had built. And I thought, I have to figure out a way to do this. I'm going to quit my job. So you can imagine my mother's reaction when I said, hey, mom, I'm going to quit this CEO job. It's like, again, have you lost your mind? But I learned from working in the housewares industry, so one of those multiple <laughs> industries that I worked in, that there were still a lot of smaller businesses that were mostly started by um, you know, the innovator, by the entrepreneur. And some of those businesses were getting older or the entrepreneurs were getting older. And that there were affordable opportunities for me to be able to acquire my own business. But at those PE firms, I did a number of mergers and acquisitions and integrations. And that also was pivotal in helping me acquire Metro Kitchen and run it today. So let me tell you a little bit about how I acquired Metro Kitchen. Some more statistics for all of you wonderful tech people. It took me eight months. I looked at 17 companies in 10 cities, and I ended up with two candidates. The cities is important because I, had, I was living in Philadelphia, as you might have guessed. It was critical because I knew it would be easier to move me. I wasn't married, didn't have any responsibilities. It would be a lot easier to move me than to try to move a company to me. Plus the labor market in Philadelphia and all the crazy tax laws, and not a good idea. I was hoping it would be in a city that I liked. As it turned out, my two candidates, well, one was in San Francisco. Oh, there's a tough call, right? And the other one is here, was here, still is here. That's Metro Kitchen. So as I said, how did I find it? Well, I wandered around trade shows. It's actually a friend of mine. Um, and looked for older guys who might be interested in selling their business. <laughs> I sent out a news release. Again, this was in 2004. Um, so the internet wasn't quite as wonderful as it is today. It got printed in one of the trade journals. And the guys who started Metro Kitchen, who were based in Atlanta, called me and said, hey, you know, they knew me from the industry. Hey, we didn't know you quit your job. We didn't know you were interested in acquiring a company. Come talk to us. The other 17 companies I looked at came from um, being involved in the industry, I was in a, an industry group um, as a CEO group. So people kept sending me opportunities. So this is Metro Kitchen. And um, as, as you heard in my intro, uh, it, it is uh, a wonderful organization, but it's a niche business. For example, we were founded in 98. You heard all this stuff. We have a very simple, focused business model that I've retained to this day. And next month is my eighth anniversary of owning the company. We only focus on well-known brands. Gee, that comes out of my brand background. Thank you. <laughs> we look for upscale consumers. And upscale can be defined a lot of different ways. Um, you know, if you're looking at someone who's 25 to 30, the upscale part of that might be a little different than someone who's 45 to 55 in terms of household income. So we are an absolute leader in a niche business. We are between number one and number three for most of the brands we sell. My favorite story here is we sell more all-clad cookware. Does anyone know what all-clad cookware is? OK, some of you. All right, it's made in Pennsylvania. It's a wonderful American-made product owned by a French company. Um, <clears throat> 
<laughs> yeah, so, um, but their headquarters are still in, in Pennsylvania, and we sell more all-clad cookware than Amazon does. I love to say that. That's one of my thrills. And this company will never be an IPO. In fact, I'm not looking for an IPO. I've played around in that market a little bit. That's not what I want to do. I love running Metro Kitchen. I have wonderful employees. We sell great products. And we treat customers the way all of us want to be treated. We have a 98% satisfaction rate. These are my rules or guidelines, I don't call them rules. These are the rules at the company. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Whether they're the employee in the cube next to you, or they're the customer on the phone, or they're the customer you're conversing with online. <clears throat> it's okay to screw up, you know? Because we all have to screw up. It's how we learn. But don't do the same thing twice. <laughs> don't screw up the same, th same way. And we have to celebrate our wins. When we do something great at the company, we might have a lunch. We might have something bigger than that. It might be just a lot of thank yous from me. It also might be really silly things that I leave on people's desk. It's very important, in my view, to celebrate the wins. So, um, kind of, there we go. So I was going to do a link here um, to Metro Kitchen. Let's see if I can pull that up so you guys can see it more in real life. And let's see, where are we here? There we go. So this is Metro Kitchen. We sell about 2,500 different SKUs. We sell about 35 different brands, knives, bakeware, cookware, accessories. So you know, you have friends that will be getting married. You have friends starting new homes, new apartments. You have family members that you need to get gifts for. Come right to Metro Kitchen, please. <laughs> So let me get back to my presentation here. And, uh, so my leadership lessons for today. So you've heard about some goofy interview stories. You've, you've heard about a lot of leadership lessons that I gained in my career, how I got to the podium. And you heard how I acquired Metro Kitchen. Don't remember any of that stuff. This is the most important stuff to remember. Be yourself, do what you love, thank people, solve the problem, own the problem, because you're the only one that can fix it, and get one blind job. So thank you very much. Best of luck. And now it's yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for coming out. Um, what was the greatest challenge that you faced when switching to the online retailing arena? Um, sleeping at night for two reasons. Um, one is, of course, I had all my assets attached to the company. But two was, it was really cool to go online and watch sales come in. I, I, I can't tell you, at 3 in the morning, how cool that was, and to know where those sales came from, which marketing device, which marketing technique caused that consumer to come to Metro Kitchen and press buy and give us our credit card information. And because in 2005, we were not shopping heavily online. So uh, it was a challenge to sleep at night. And I know that wasn't quite what you were looking for, but it, it really was because I was so excited about seeing people buying online from this business. Uh, my other challenge was just making my way in Atlanta because all I did was work for six months. <laughs> and then I sort of looked around and said, oh, I don't know anyone here except the people that I work with. And fortunately, I met someone in the audience through an organization called Women Corporate Directors that was part of the introduction. And um, here I am. Thanks. Hello, my name is Kevin White. I'm a Hi. senior business student here. Uh, so when you purchased Metro Kitchen, did you use leverage like as in a private equity setting, or did you use m much more of your own capital when you purchased the company? All of my own capital. I did not want. Uh, a private equity situation after having just left two of them. 
Thank so you. I was either going to make it work or I was going to be working at Macy's or somewhere <laughs> like that. So. It looks like it turned out good for you. <laughs> Hi. Um, in a corporate environment where it's a lot harder <laughs> Over here. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> it's, there, you know, there's a light in my eyes, yeah. so it's kind of hard to see. Yes. Um, in a corporate environment where it's a lot harder to get promoted from within and uh -huh. employer, employee tenure is a lot shorter, I guess what advice can you give to us as we're entering the industry? Um, I, I'm not sure that I agree with you that employee tenure is a lot shorter. Um, it's a lot shorter today than it was in, 19, in the 1980s or the 1970s. Um, are you, maybe you can tell me a little more about what's behind your question and I can try to answer it better than I'm doing right now. Uh, well, I'm a computer science major, okay. so I'm interested in web development, um, web design stuff. Um, I've had a couple internships and I've just noted that the turnover rate um, is a lot higher and people are getting different jobs at other companies to get promoted. Um, so I guess w if you have any advice on. OK. Yeah. All right, that, that helps um, put some more context around your question. I, I think part of that is actually the field that you've selected to start your career in. Um, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's going to change. And that's no different than it was 10 or 15 years ago, frankly. Is in technology, you need to move around to move up. Um, so as far as advice, I, I would give the same advice to you as anyone else. Make sure you're doing what you love. Make sure you are yourself in what you're doing. Figure out how to self solve problems before anyone else can figure that out. Figure, figure out that there are problems before anyone else, including your boss, especially your boss, has figured out their problems and help him or her solve that problem. That, those would be my basic pieces of advice. Okay. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you for coming out this thank afternoon, you. first of all. Um, You're welcome. I was just curious um, as to what you use for sort of um, practical ways to um, show appreciation slash recognize your employees right now in Metro Kitchen. Uh, well, the list is kind of long. <laughs> so I've done everything from had people over to my home for dinners that I cooked. And oh, by the way, I didn't buy Metro Kitchen because I like to cook. I actually just like to entertain. But people always ask me that question. Anyway, um, so it's amazing what having someone to your home will do. Um, and it was particularly important when I first moved here because all of my employees thought I was moving the company to Philadelphia at some point or another. It was, you know, family, friends, everyone back up north. Um, I, I think that the meal sharing thing, whether you bring in a bunch of pizzas <laughs> or you have people to your house or you give them gift cards for restaurants so they can take their kids or their spouse or their whatever um, out to dinner because of how hard they've been working. You know, we're a retail business. So 50% of our revenues come between November and the end of January. The, from the day after, th actually from Thanksgiving, through about the 20th of December, we all work like dogs. We work seven days a week, you know, countless hours. And so I feel that I really have to thank my employees for that. And I have to thank their family members or their partners or, you know, their, their personal connections as well. And so that's why the restaurant-y kind of gift cards are um, important. I've also done things where I've given little stars out, little star pins, not the stars, you know, they get pasted somewhere. Uh, and, and I try to, I'm always trying to look for something that's unusual, that might make people laugh because, you know, life is r really too short and you should be able to have some fun what you do, what you do for a living. So if they can get some laughs out of it, I've given out decks of cards that have like little coupons in them or goofy puzzles or just, it, it, it really varies. Um, and all of my employees um, get a bonus, depending on the results of the company, of course. So, so if you work in the warehouse, you run operations, whatever it is, everyone gets bonuses. So. Next, okay. Hi. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for coming today. I really enjoyed everything you've had to say today. What specifically from your business education do you reflect on most in owning your own business and what was most important to you from your? From uh, MBA, from Pitt? Yes. Um, so I said I have an undergrad degree in journalism. I took uh, one accounting course and I took it pass fail. <laughs> So going to business school, I took a lot of courses in between when I finished college and starting business school, you know, statistics and all kinds of stuff to try to get my analytical skills um, in better shape than they were. Um, so what I use every day, not just at Metro Kitchen, but especially when I started at General Mills um, and a lot at Pepsi, is, is all the analytical skills and the discipline that I learned in business school. They, they, they are absolutely essential, absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question about um, when you acquired the company Metro Kitchen uh, after you have uh, found the private equity firm, what was your main point for investment? Uh, like, uh, what was your investment rational when you acquired the company? Um, my investment rationale for acquiring Metro Kitchen. Um, I didn't want to be 80 years old and look back and say, gee, I wish I would have. I, I, I know that sounds really stupid, but that's one of the things that drove me the most in, in, a, in trying to acquire a company and then in acquiring Metro Kitchen. Um, I, I really, I thought it was time for me to do it myself. And if I didn't do it then, you know, did I want to look back and say, oh, gee, I wish I would have. So that was a piece of it. Why I picked Metro Kitchen um, versus the company in San Francisco, although that was highly attractive, but um, as the numbers worked. I could make the numbers work. I saw that there was huge growth potential for a, an e-commerce retailer. I didn't realize how how fast that would happen, um, and how much competition would come into the market about three years later. But um, it, it was really, I saw potential with the company, um, that, and the numbers worked. And I knew that I had a lot of the skills that the previous, that the founders um, didn't have, primarily in the area of, you know, interaction with customers, customer marketing, oh, the consumer being my boss. So you just answered my question, like oh. exactly. So that was kind of. Uh, I guess what was your biggest challenge in moving to Atlanta specifically? Uh, personally or professionally or both? Both. Um, hmm. I, one of the biggest ones was you know six months into it, looking up and saying, oh gee, I don't ha I don't have a business network here. I don't have a friendship network here. Mm -hmm. So both of them were important to me. I had, the, had a very big, I had a lot of friends in Philly, and I had family there. Um, I also had a very strong business network there, and a lot of um, uh, women in business. Uh, I belonged to an organization there called the Forum of Executive Women. I had been on the board, membership chair, and all that stuff. So I knew lots of people, which meant I could get a lot of things done, both in my company and in the community for whatever organizations I happened to be volunteering for. So I miss that, but I, and I haven't created. I will be honest and say I haven't created it to the level that I had in Philadelphia. Um, partly because I also live outside of New York City because my husband lives there, and, and I try to have a life in both places. So um, business-wise, <clears throat> the biggest challenge was I was coming out of a traditional marketing background you know, general manager, CEO of some fairly good sized companies, um, not so much the CEO, but the general manager. And I didn't know a thing about internet marketing. I knew, ver I knew what the average, you know, person knew about the internet. You know, I used it, I knew how to make it work. I, I, I bought a little bit of stuff online, but I didn't know how to sell to a consumer online. I didn't know, any of the tools that Metro Kitchen used to build its business, I had to—I didn't know how to do Google AdWords. I didn't even know what Google AdWords were then. 
So um, I learned all of that in a very short period of time, which was a challenge, but it was a great challenge. I mean, I love learning. So to be able to, to look at a whole new way to market and know exactly what, what everything, every dollar you spend on marketing, what it's bringing back to your company, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Hey, you. Oh. Hey. OK, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> yes. um, I guess I have a two-part uh, question. OK. Uh, the first one is, how important do you think is it to get experience at a big company before going to business school? And then the uh, second question would be, um, how important is the ability for one to do an MBA before switching from a staff job to a line job? Um, I think as long as you get some big company experience, I don't think it matters when you get it. You know, I got my big company experience after getting an MBA, not, not before. I mean, I had some work experience, you know, you know going to business school. Um, line versus staff, I, I don't think the MBA matters in that uh, when you do it. Uh, I think you need, probably, need, if, you're, if you're a finance major, for example, um, and you're looking in some kind of uh, financial analyst job for a big company, uh, that probably helps to, to do a financial analyst, basic financial analyst job, and then go say, hey, let me help run a, a plant or, you know, and it, it's going to depend on the kind of company it is, too. So I think you need to get some functional experience and whatever you went to um, business school for, and then sort of parlay it into um, the, the um, line job experience. Um, thanks fine. for the great presentation. Um, I have a question about the acquisition you had. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, you were thinking about 17 companies to choose from. And uh, did you also think about uh, starting your own business? Or um, was if so, why did you choose acquisition over? I actually had that in my presentation and just dumped it um, today. I was trying to listen to what you guys were interested in, too. Um, I have never had a good idea for a business. So I've never wanted to invest in myself in one of my ideas, because none of them are any good. I knew that I was good at taking something that lives and breathes and taking it to the next level. I knew that I wasn't good at saying, oh, wow, here's a thing. I know this thing can be really big, so let me build this thing. I, 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 I just didn't, I'm not good at that. I'm still not good at that. Um, I much prefer to take a living, breathing object and move it forward. So I, I didn't even consider any doing anything on my own because I had no ideas. <laughs> We have a number of students um, in school who are looking at developing internet startups. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of, the, one of the questions they all struggle with is how do, they drive, how do you drive traffic to a website? And being a marketing guru like you are, I'm just curious in terms of uh, how, how do you drive traffic to Metro's Kitchen's website? And also, do you track customer acquisition costs very closely? Yeah. Um, you know, driving uh, traffic and customers to a website today is uh, a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive than driving traffic, et cetera, was eight years ago, certainly 15 years ago. So we drive traffic to our site in a few different ways. Uh, yes, Google AdWords, but we don't buy keywords like pot <laughs> or pan. We buy all clad. Culinary Institute of America, pots or pans. You know, we, and we buy lots of long tail because consumers have become so much more sophisticated in their search that they want a Wusthof 3.2 inch salami knife with a serrated edge. Okay, we sell those. Well, actually, we don't sell the 3.2 inch. They don't make the 3.2 inch. But um, the, the long tail keyword and understanding what your understanding your consumer. You know, going back to the consumer is my boss thing. Understanding what your consumers want, what they need, what you sell that can help them meet those requirements, 
is really key. So we do a lot of paid search. Because we're an old company, sounds funny to say an old company, 15 years old, but we are. Um, we get a lot of points um, from Google's algorithm. Of course, no one knows what's actually in the algorithm, right? Um, but we, we are ranked pretty highly on a lot of organic searches. So if you go in and you just enter all clad in Google, a little bit less so on Bing, but in Google, we're going to be on the first page, which is, well, where else would you want to be? <laughs> yes, we're, we're generally in the top box on paid search, but we're on the first page on organic or natural search, whatever you guys call it. So um, that's, those are two key things for us. We also, um, when I acquired the company, our uh, consumer repeat rate was, well, they didn't really know. Um, they never measured it. And so uh, I think it was probably somewhere around 10%. Well, it's significantly higher than that now. And a lot of that has come from all the things you're used to seeing. You know, they don't seem new to you, but they were new in 2006. For example, how many emails a day do you get from Barnes & Noble or, you know, from the sports authority or whatever it is that you guys like to do in your free time? Tons of them, right? So we started doing email marketing direct to our co consumers in 2000 and late 2005. No one, Williams Sonoma, who's our biggest competitor, Macy's, Crate and Barrel, none of those guys were doing emails back then. So that was a big advantage to us. And we still do a lot of them, uh, a tremendous number. And they drive a lot of revenue for us. And it's great revenue because emails are not expensive to do. Yes, you have staff costs for them, but and you have a little bit of a distribution cost, but they're great because they're just bringing your customers back. Um, and you might have, we've been putting <clears throat> some products, some brands on sale um, because we've been very competitive with companies like Williams Sonoma. Well, we've acquired a lot of new customers, a lot of new consumers from that, and we want to keep marketing to them and bring them back for the second purchase. Um, so those are sort of the big ones. But we use shopping, I think we, you guys would know everything else we do. We use shopping comparison sites. Of course, we have a Facebook page. We do blogs that show up on Facebook. Yes, we have a Twitter account. We're just too small um, for uh, having a viable Twitter account. We have to have one, but, and we have followers, but it's pretty small. I, I don't think that's the right medium, if you will, for Metro Kitchen. But we, so we get revenue from Facebook, we get revenue from our blogs. We are listed on a lot of our brands' sites. So, you know, if you go to Wusthof Knives, where to buy, Metro Kitchen will be there. That drives business to our site. Um, I, don't, I, I think I've covered most of them. <laughs> In yes, hearing sorry. your, uh, it's a fascinating story, and um, I'm, I find myself wondering uh, two, two things that are kind of related. The, the first is, does location matter? Because I hear you having to be on the, this plane, living in two places, why, and mm -hmm. not having a network in, it, in Atlanta when you first came. Couldn't an internet company move is one of the questions. And then second is, uh, what's behind the web page? How many employees are there? Is there real estate? Do you have inventory? Or does it get shipped out from the, uh, the manufacturers? I'll, I'll so just a little bit, okay. you know, what's backstage? The background. OK, I'll, I'll start with that one first, because it's an easier one to answer. Um, we carry 99% of the products you'll see on our website. The reason we do that, so we have you know, a lot of zeros of inventory. Um, the reason that we do that is because we want to take care of our customers. You saw one of the slides I had up there. We have 98% customer satisfaction. We measure it every month, but we also sell through Amazon, and our number um, is 98% on Amazon as well. So the other, the other part of customer service is Yes, we have people who answer the phones. Wow, that's in this country, actually in Marietta specifically. Um, and every one of those people, every one of the people in our warehouse, me, all the tech people, we're all trained on those brands by the brands. So I can tell you more than you'd ever want to know about how a Wusthof knife is made more than I ever wanted to know, actually, until I got into this business. But it's good to be the product expert. So that's the reason that we fulfill. 
there are a handful of products that we don't carry in the warehouse. They tend to be very large. Um, pot racks, you know, uh, butcher block tables, or they're really expensive, like a $5,000 espresso machine. We, we don't need those in the warehouse. So um, that's, that's the background on what we do. Um, I had a, a thought. I just forgot what it was around that. Oh, <clears throat> we answer the phone. Um, and often the calls are, well, how long is the handle on that knife? Well, knives are measured by the size of their blade, not by the size of their handle. So we can go back in the warehouse and go measure that handle. You do that enough times and you say, well, why don't we put this on the website? So on the website, we have measurements for all sorts of things that you'd never even think that anyone would want to know. Well, they do. And so that's another definition of customer service or consumer service for us. It's on the web in as, as many things as we can think of to put on the more information part of our site, they're on there. Um, your second question was related to um, vocation, avocation. Um, I choose to live in both places. It's weird, I know, um, but it works for me. <laughs> um, and I choose to not move the company uh, to the Northeast, partly because it's a lot cheaper to run a business in Georgia than it is in the Northeast. Um, but also because I have phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal employees. And uh, you know, we're all replaceable, right? In some way, shape, or form, we're all replaceable. But I don't want to have to replace these employees because they're great. Huh? Lynn, thanks for speaking at Georgia Tech today. Oh. Thank you.